Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'd just like to welcome everybody to the River of Life, especially those that are watching us live on social media this morning. I'm so glad you're able to join us today through our Facebook page. And if you're ever in the area of the metropolis of Wilbur, Oregon, feel free to stop by Sunday mornings at 1030 or Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. We would love to have you. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about the word this morning. Uh, I got a call yesterday. Hey, guess what? You're going to bring forth the word. And uh, as always, if I have an opportunity to speak the word of God, it's an excitement for me. So I went ahead and accepted the invitation. And I'm so thankful for our pastor that she would let me have the honor of bringing forth the word this morning. Amen. So if you are one who tracks things that are on God's calendar, You'll notice that we are coming into the time of Passover and the time that we are entering into where we celebrate Easter, the resurrection of Christ. And uh, on the Gregorian calendar, on our calendar that we follow, uh, Passover starts on the evening of March 27th and it goes till April 4th. You know what's important about April 4th? It's your birthday. It's my birthday. <laughs> but also, it's Easter, so that's important too, right? So, uh, but uh, again, yours is right before, so that's how you remember those things. Uh, so anyways, uh, I thought it was most appropriate to talk about some things that are leading up to the Passover, and then of course, uh, at the time of Jesus, which led up to the time of uh, him giving his life on the cross and the resurrection. So uh, normally when I speak, I bring a lot of depth of scripture, but today we're just going to cover Exodus chapter 7 through 11. So... You can take notes on that. You can actually follow along, but I'm not going to read any of the scripture, which is unusual for me. But uh, that's just the way it is today. So chapter 7 through 11 of Exodus. Exodus is one of my favorite books. I don't know if it's because I just really love the story uh, or if it uh, I actually did live in Egypt for six months. And so maybe that's why it's uh, I have a connection with it. But I just absolutely love the book of Exodus. And here we see in Exodus chapter 7 that Moses is going before the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt at the time, and saying, let my people go. And uh, Pharaoh isn't really happy with that. So what caused this situation to happen? Well, let's take a step back a few generations, right? So when Abraham was called by God to establish the people of Israel, uh, at the end of his kind of uh, journey there, uh, God spoke to Abraham and said, you will have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands of the sea, right, or the shore. Uh, but he also said, there will be a time where your children will be in captivity for 430 years. So uh, we already knew that the slavery of the Israelites were going to happen in Egypt. Uh, God already announced that. Uh, but how it kind of came about was we think of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. Joseph went to Egypt and became the governor of Egypt. He was very prosperous solely by the hand of God that was with him. And because he was so prosperous, the Pharaoh at the time welcomed his family to come and reside in the land of Goshen. And Goshen was the best nicest part of Egypt. It was just beautiful, fertile lands. It was amazing. And the Pharaoh loved Joseph so much. He says, I can't reward you any other better way than to place your family in the best spot of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so the Egyptians and the Israelites lived together uh, and they prospered greatly. But after a while, the Pharaoh passed away and Joseph passed away and the leaders begin to pass away. And with that, the understanding that it was the hand of God that blessed Egypt and blessed the Israeli people passed away with it as well. And because they forgot about God, they forgot about the God that brought forth the miracles and prospered Egypt, the pharaohs that came to power began to not understand why Israel was living in the nicest places of Egypt. And as a result, they were entered into slavery. And so after these time frame of slavery, there was a, a specific part where God said, it's time to bring my people out of slavery, and he called forth Moses to do that. And so 
we are now at the part where Moses is ready to set the people free through the direction of God. And during this time frame, the Pharaoh is having a really hard time with the hardening of his heart. And he just doesn't want to let the people go. And so we see in this time frame that God is going to accomplish three different things through these ten plagues. And so the, uh, before I get into those three things, uh, God spoke to Moses and he said, These plagues that are happening will be a story for you to pass down for generation after generation after generation. And what God is saying is it's important for you to tell this story of what happened on these days where God set these plagues about to change the hearts of Pharaoh and change the hearts of the children of Israel. And so the problem that we had at the time is there was no separation between paganism and the Israelites. And like I said earlier, where both the pharaohs in Egypt and the Israelites forgot about God, they began to intertwine their beliefs and they became kind of one people in a sense. And the Israelites were taking on the ways of Egypt, meaning there was over 2,000 pagan gods that the Egyptians worshipped at that time frame. And you'll notice in these plagues that if you study these uh, these pagan gods of the time of Egypt, they they separated their gods into like a, a, a major god and kind of a minor god. And as we're looking at these plagues, you can see that God is provoking Egypt by also saying that your god is not as strong as me. And so we can see an example in the first plague, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute, but... Uh, Oh, I feel like I'm in college. You know, I took my little notes here and everything. But uh, the god of K A or K H N U M Kunum, I don't know. That's what it's called when I'm preaching. Yeah. There you go. But uh, uh, he was the god that sustained life. And when we when we hear about how the Nile River was a life sustaining thing for them. They, they recognize this God as the one who sustained life. And so here we're going to see that God is like basically smacking this fake God in the face saying, you're not the God that sustains life. I'm the God that sustains life. Amen. We're going to see in plague number four that this God of Uchichet was this fly God. Okay? And without going too deep into him, because I don't want to give this fly God any glory, uh, you'll see the plague of flies that come on the land. Yeah. And so it's kind of like what you looked as your deity is now your biggest problem. Right. So I think that's kind of exciting and cool that maybe we never recognized in the past. And so it's, it's kind of slick. So once again, where God is using these 10 plagues to separate paganism from God's people. Now keep in mind that the Torah the law of God has not been given to the children of Israel yet. So they're living in ignorance in a sense of, of God and how to serve God. And so uh, in order for God to give this law as a precious thing for them, as a pathway of life and blessing, as a way of, of living your life that brings glory to God but also prospers yourself, uh, he had to take them out of the world in a sense. He had to take them away and show distinction between paganism and God's people so that's very important to recognize so what are the three things that God has established in uh, in these plagues well number one and we'll talk about this God first establishes his deity number two God establishes his people and three God establishes his salvation so Kind of put that those three things in your mind as we go through each one. So the first one, establishing God's deity. God is establishing his deity to both Pharaoh and to the people of Israel. And so the plague number one, right? The Nile River turns to blood. In keeping uh, an understanding of what the Nile River is, the Nile River brings water to the land of Egypt from the Mediterranean Sea. And so... Uh, without this flow of river, 
There would be no water for the crops. There would be no fish. There would, a lot of the life-sustaining things of Egypt's land come from the Nile River, and still to this day. <laughs> uh, so the, the people of Egypt celebrated this God that brought forth life and life that came from the Nile River. And so by God turning into blood, which I thought was interesting, if we look at the human body, it is the blood that flows that brings life to the body. Amen. Once the heart stops, the blood stops flowing, and therefore there's no more life into the body, right? Amen. And so God is saying, I have the power to control life, and I'm stopping your so-called life being brought to your land. Amen. Pretty powerful God. Right? Amen. Now, what's interesting is this affected both Egypt and Israel at the time. Number two, the, the plague of frogs. Frogs are interesting creatures. We've all heard frogs. I have experience with frogs. I have a little pond out in front of my house, and I acquired three frogs by them just hopping into my pond. And they were cute the first three days. You know, and you kind of like listen to them at night, and you're like, oh, this is relaxing. But after a few days, frogs are not relaxing. <laughs> to the point where I thought they were like huge, big bullfrogs. Oh no. After I tore apart the water fountain system and every single rock and everything else, I find three of these tiny, tiny little <laughs> frogs that are so loud. So we could have just been inhumane and flushed them down the toilet, but we didn't. We actually put them in a little box and the boys and everybody, we went down to the river and we let them survive somewhere else not in our pond right? but the thing about frogs is you know they serve a purpose they eat the bugs and but they're not other than being annoying they don't really like harm us they just exist and that was what was going on with both the children of Israel and the Pharaoh they they just existed they didn't ever say that God is not real but they also didn't like acknowledge that God was real and so as a result, they just kind of existed. And I thought it was interesting that, one, in Egypt, they did have a frog god. But two, uh, God is using the frogs to wake them up and let them know uh, that uh, I do exist. And he's provoking them to recognize the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Next plague. Uh, the gnats, right? Here's a word for you. Anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. That's a hard word to say. But this word is basically mankind having godlike traits. So if we look at it and nowadays, if you've ever seen the cartoon or read the book Winnie the Pooh, you see that animals who do not have normally human traits now live in a house, they can talk, they communicate, they have fun, they go out and play, right? So these animals that don't have these features now kind of are resembling humans, right? Well, here we see that there are sorcerers that are casting spells and they're laying down their staffs and they're turning into serpents and they're doing these like mystical things that are, that are uh, wicked, but they have these godlike traits where they have these superpowers in a sense. And so uh, when the gnats came, the sorcerers created gnats as well, but not in the capacity of God. And, uh, and so here they basically looked at God and said, this has to be God pointing his finger at us because we do not have the sorcery power to be able to do this mighty of a plague on our land. And so... Here, God is establishing his deity, going, I am all-powerful. You and your little wicked ways of sorcery can come nowhere near the mighty power of God. And so once again, God is establishing his deity, his separation from man, showing us that he is almighty, powerful, and the creator and the giver of life to both Egypt and the children of Israel. Moving on to the next ones, but we're also moving into a different phase. We see that now God is establishing his people. What's very interesting from here on out is the plagues no longer affect the people of Israel. 
they only affect the people of Egypt. And so the flies start coming in. And uh, the thing about the flies is God is making an establishment here. He's saying that no longer will my people of Israel live as animals. Right? Animals do what they want. Uh, I had two dogs, and uh, my younger dog, Scooter, he, when food would come, he would push Macy out of the way, who was an older dog and female. And uh, he didn't care. He would just eat the food. It didn't matter if Macy got any food or not. Why? Because he's an animal. He doesn't take into consideration that the other dog is female, the other dog is older, you know, he just goes for the food because that's his animal nature, right? And so God here is saying, no longer are you going to live your lives as animals and obey the flesh and just do as you please, but now you'll distinguish yourselves as children of God and separate yourself from the world, and you'll live by a different ways of life, and everybody will know that God is with you. That's a big, powerful statement for us today. And so then, the next one, we see the disease came on the cattle and destroyed Egypt's property and livestock and totally destroyed their food source, totally dis uh, destroyed their economy. And once again, this did not affect the children of Israel, but it did affect the people of Egypt. And, uh, and God was speaking to them and saying that you are not the controller of your life, you are not the controller of your economy, uh, that God is the God who controls all of that stuff, and it is by his hand we are blessed. And this also is affecting Pharaoh to where he's realizing that what he's doing is, uh, is sinful, and it's leading into repentance. But then the next plague happens with the boils on the skin, right? So now the people of Egypt are suffering from these boils on their skin, and they're uncomfortable, and they... And, and uh, it got to the point where the sorcerers could no longer stand before Moses and stand before Pharaoh and perform their, their wickedness because their human body just could not handle the boils on their skin. And I believe this is a direct uh, uh, statement that God is making is God, God brings health to our bodies. You know, I don't know. I, you know, of course, sickness is in the world because of, of sin, you know. When we are created, we are created to be perfect and healthy, and our bodies were different, uh, you know, and as a result nowadays, our fleshly body dies. And so uh, here God is saying that uh, I can bring healing. Um, it is your rebellion that is bringing this sickness upon you at this time. And, uh, and as a result, uh, it led Pharaoh more towards repentance. And then we see the last one, which was hail. And I find this one very interesting because it talks about the hail coming to the earth. Uh, Egypt, once again, the river is what sustained the life of Egypt. It doesn't rain very often in Egypt. Uh, and if it does, maybe it's up at the Mediterranean coastline and stuff, you know, it'll, coastal storms, things like that. But through this part of Egypt, uh, very rarely does rain come to the ground. Like I said, water comes in through the Nile River. And so here we've seen that there's this great storm of hail coming in, and also it talks of fire coming. Now, I don't know. I don't know if it's actual fire, but also, to me, it kind of describes lightning. So this is Nickology here. I'm not saying this is how it is, but I mean, to me, it might have been like massive amounts of electrical storm that caused fires all over the world, and, or all over Egypt, and, and they were not used to that type of storm. And uh, that provoked uh, Pharaoh to repentance even more. And if you notice in the Bible, it talks about that the, the, the Nile River sustains the life of Egypt. But in Israel, it rains. And so the water comes to Israel through rain. And rain is an example of God's presence. And, uh, and when it rains in Israel, they believe that God is with us because he's brought the rain. Uh, but in Egypt... Not a lot of rain. The, the water uh, brings in their nourishment. So I thought that was an interesting thing to look at. But. Oh, I'm sorry. One more. Locusts. Right? The locusts came in after that. Locusts come in and destroy everything. They eat whatever's left. 
it just completely wipes out. Uh, I've told this story many times, but I remember at my old house, they used to have this really big cherry tree. And I remember going to work one morning and seeing these perfect cherries in the tree and thinking, I'm gonna come home and pick those. And then when I got home from work, I saw these birds just come in, consume the tree. They ate every cherry and then they flew away and the cherries were gone. And I was amazed that they just swarmed in and destroyed. And it reminds me of this locust where I could imagine when the wind blows and just millions and millions and millions of locusts come in, they destroy everything and then the wind blows and then they're gone off into the, into the ocean. How devastating that would be. But once again, pride gets in the way and refusal to repent or refusal to stay in repentance it comes in like locusts and that pride destroys everything next version right the salvation of god so we see last two plagues that have come in so far we've seen eight now there's two left the first one is darkness has brought over egypt the rabbis of old and in, in, the, in the Bible explains this as well. It says that the darkness fell over their eyes and that the people of Egypt couldn't see. And so I don't know if it's necessarily the sun goes out, but I do know that the people of Egypt could not see. But once again, there was separation and the children of Israel could see. And it talks about how the children of Israel was a light to this world and that because the Hebrews could see, they would guide the Egyptians and they would help the Egyptian people. So now we're not necessarily talking about the time, you know, it's like Star Wars where you only see the Pharaoh and the lead character fighting it out. Well, what about the rest of the galaxy? So now we're thinking, okay, we're not talking about the Pharaoh and Moses here, but look out to the people of the land, the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen, and think about what's going on here. And so here, these people are blinded but yet the children of Israel can see. And the children of Israel are going to them and they're comforting them and they're saying, let us help you. And they're blessing them and they're showing them the way. Later on, because of this, the Egyptians were so thankful for this that the Bible talks about how God softened their heart and they gave the Israelites all their gold and silver. And so... All the movies, all the old school things that we've talked about where the children of Israel are leaving the Red Sea and they're broken, busted, and disgusted, and they're poor, and they're sick. None of that's true. The children of Israel left Egypt with all the gold and silver of Egypt, and they went out strong, they went out healthy, and they went out wealthy. Because that's the God that we serve, a prosperous God. And so it's ironic that the darkness lasted for a total of three days. But in that three days, it was so impacting that the Egyptians were so thankful for the Israelites for showing them the way. The, the, the Israelites became a light to the world. And that leads us in to the last plague that came on. And uh, this is where we celebrate the Passover. And God spoke to Moses, and he reminds them that when Moses was born, the Pharaoh at the time killed the firstborn of all of the Hebrew people to try and stop Moses. And so it's reconciliation in some ways, but uh, it, uh, it, it's a strong message to the Egyptian people that, uh, that living in this world will bring death. And so here, God instructs the people of Israel, he says, if you will take the Passover lamb and you'll slaughter it and you'll put the blood on the doorpost of your home, you're going to be saved. And there's a whole message in this about taking this lamb into your house and feeding it and loving the lamb uh, and your children bonding with the lamb, and then all of a sudden you have to slaughter the lamb. And uh, how this could be emotional to your family where I love this lamb, and now this lamb has to die on my behalf. And, uh, <clears throat> and we see that when it comes to Jesus, where 
his followers loved him and he spent time with them, but they recognized that the lamb had to die so that salvation could come to the world. So here we see that God instructs the Hebrew people to take this blood of this lamb and put it on the doorpost of their home. And when the death angel comes, so God isn't a God that brings death. God just allowed his, like, uh, his, his army of angels or whatever to move out of the way and his protection to where the death angel could fly free. But the death angel had rules to follow. And when the death angel saw the blood on the house, it had to peshka, that's Hebrew for Passover, that household, and the death angel could not harm those who were saved by the blood of the lamb. And so here we see that that dreadful night that the firstborn to include Pharaoh's own son was struck by the curse and all of the firstborn of Egypt were killed. But once again, bringing separation between the world and God's people, God brought salvation through the blood of the lamb. And I think that's the most important message that I have uh, when it comes to thinking about Passover in this time of why we celebrate it is the opportunity was always there for Egypt and the world. They just had to accept the gift that was presented before them. And it's still that way today that though it's been over 2,000 years since Jesus has come to this earth, the opportunity is still there for us. Amen. And so what I'd like to do, and I can feel the presence of God coming in here and it's causing me to be a little emotional, uh, but I also know that if you're watching online this morning, that the presence of God is probably right there with you as well. And uh, I know he is by fact, and at this time, if you would like to open up your heart and receive him, I know that God wants to minister to you today. And so let's take a moment here real quick. If you could, if, I know you might be holding your phone or watching on TV as we stream, but just lift up your hand for a moment and, and connect with me and connect with God. And I want to open up uh, an opportunity for you to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. So uh, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart and received him as your Savior, I would like to welcome you to do that today and all you have to do is just pray right along with me so let's pray together here in this room father god we come to you in the name of jesus lord we come to you uh, with our hearts we come to you as we're standing here in the sanctuary here and lord we're coming to you as we're following along on, on our stream father we're united together with people all over the world that are watching this video right now father lord right now we just ask that you come into our hearts father Lord, just as Pharaoh had to recognize that you are the Almighty, Father, Lord, right now we recognize that you are God, Father. And Lord, even though there's times of plagues and destructions and problems in the world at that time, Father, Lord, we recognize that though there's times of plagues and destruction and tough times in our community right now, Lord, we look to you. We look to you for strength. And Lord, we apply the blood of the Lamb on our doorposts of our house. And Lord, we receive salvation, Father. Lord, we just thank you that uh, you're a God of blessing, you're a God of hope, you're a God of strength, you're a God that has never left your people, Father. And Lord, I pray right now that we would recognize the power that's in you, the love that is in you, Father. And Lord, we receive that blessing right now, not someday, but today, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you've just given your heart to God, or you feel like that this message has really touched you, uh, I'd welcome you to leave a comment on our stream. Uh, and also, if you would like to reach out to us at the River of Life, we'd be more than happy to connect with you and help answer some questions. And uh, hopefully we can love you. And uh, you <laughs> not hopefully, but I mean, through this, we will show our love to you. Hopefully, as in you'll reach out to us so that we can love on you, is what I was trying to say. And... Uh, but most of all, we, we hope that uh, you've experienced God's presence today. And, and that's what this place is all about, is creating an environment that you feel God's love and presence and that you know that he's real in your life and that he loves you. So with that, thank you all for tuning in today. Thank you all for coming to church today on this Sunday. And we want you to know that we love you. Talk to you later.